Well, friends, this morning I am so blessed and honored that our very own pastoral intern for the summer, Tyler, is going to be uh, leading us in the sermon this morning. For those of you who don't know, uh, Tyler has been with us for the entire summer. He's been at just about everything you can imagine in life for the church. And this morning, this will be his final Sunday with us. Um, and so, yeah, as a part of that, he's going to leave us with a word that God has given him to share with us. And so this morning, will you please welcome Tyler. Good morning. Our scripture reading for today is Romans 12, 1 through 8. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly, as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now, as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. According to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. If prophecy... Use it according to the proportion of one's faith. If service, use it in service. If teaching, in teaching. And if exhorting, in exhortation. Giving with generosity. Leading with diligence. Showing mercy with cheerfulness. This is the word of, uh, word of God for us, the people of God. Together we say. Amen. Set this down here. I'll be back up there. <laughs> is it good now? It's like a little... Echo? We good? Okay. So in the seventh grade, I ate an entire bag of Lifesavers. Not the gummy kind, um, the mint kind. An entire bag. A friend gave them to me, and I ate the entire thing. Like, I just chewed them. It was, like, it was a monstrous act. Like, it really was. Um, and in 30 minutes, as 12-year-olds do, I had forgotten that I had eaten them. I don't know how, but I had seriously forgotten that I had had a single lifesaver that day. But later that day, I felt a sharp pain in my stomach. Fun fact, that's what happens if you eat an entire bag of mint lifesavers. So in all of my wisdom, at the age of 12, I concluded that I was dying, and I decided I was going to go to the school nurse. And on the way there, I ran into a friend whose dad was a doctor and who said he wanted to be a doctor when he was older. Again... In all of my wisdom, that made him a doctor. And so I told him, my stomach's hurting. And he was like, well, like, what did you have to eat today? And I said, nothing. I haven't eaten anything all day. My stomach just hurts, and I think that I'm dying. With his medical expertise in hand, he quickly diagnosed me and said, you definitely have an appendicitis, and you will die if you don't go to the hospital soon. When I get to the nurse, I quickly tell her that I was having an appendicitis, which uh, I later learned was just appendicitis, not an appendicitis, and that I needed her to take me to the hospital immediately. I thought that she could do that. After informing me that she was not going to take me to the hospital, as well as the fact that losing my appendix would not kill me, she asked where it hurt. I pointed to the lower left side of my stomach. And if you don't know, your appendix is in the lower right side of your stomach. I did not think she had her information correct. So I said, okay, if I go home and my appendix bursts, what will happen to me? And she said, nothing really. Your body doesn't need it. It's not essential. Transitioning to our lives, how many of us have felt like the appendix? Whether in a relationship, whether in a job, whether in a friendship or in a community, how many of us have felt not necessary, or, or even worse, not wanted. I absolutely have. Whether it's a relationship in which you weren't valued, friends that talk behind your back, a job where you are not felt as though you are a, a valued member, all of us have felt this way. On the flip side of that, how many of us knowingly or unknowingly have made others feel like the appendix? Unfortunately, in the church, 
That's all of us. And we may not mean to, we may not want to, but knowingly or unknowingly, all of us in some situations have made others feel as though they are not necessary and needed. Like they are the appendix. In Romans 12, Paul talks about the church as a body. In Romans 12, 4 and 5, Paul writes, Now as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. This is not the only physical metaphor we find relating to the church or even to the body. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Paul writes, Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. We find references to the church as the bride of Christ throughout the Bible, in Ephesians, 2 Corinthians, and Revelation. The call, then, for unity in the church is strong. And I hate the phrase, the Bible is clear, because so often it is not. But in this instance, it is clear. Our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit, one that is not our own. The church, likewise, is not our own. It is not my church or your church, but rather a collection of everyone that God has called his own. It is the collection of believers, not a building, not a person, not a personality, but a collection unified in their belief and their commitment to Christ. And how great is it that the church is a collection, that we don't have to do things the same way. I am great at talking to people. I love talking to people. My parents are here. They'll tell you, I love talking to people too much. I would get in trouble in school all the time for talking to people. And the youth are here, and they can tell you, I am terrible at manual labor, like the worst at it. I don't know how to use a drill. This summer, we've gotten to do a lot. And at Lakeview, I was able to keep up with the kids. Thanks to energy drinks and pre-workout. Yeah, but I was able to keep up with them. And we would talk and we would have a ton of energy. And I, I think I freaked some of the older adults out because like, you know, they would hear middle schoolers screaming and I'd be in the middle of them screaming too, right? But at Lakeview, that's where I'm at my best. Then we went to UM Army two weeks later and I was a work team adult. And I was at my worst. And for the first project, they said, uh, uh, Riley told me they were gonna give me step-by-step -step Lego instructions. For my first project, they said, Tyler, you're gonna build a four by four porch with five steps. And they sent me out there. So we sat there for four hours waiting for an adult to come and tell us what to do. But the point is, is we all have gifts and we all have things that we are terrible at. But if we truly embody, as the Bible tells us to do, doing everything you do for the glory of God, we are, we are able to let our strengths shine and others pick up the slack. How beautiful is that? Thank God for other work team adults <laughs> because we would have gotten nothing done, right? And some of you, I'm gonna be honest, are terrible at talking to people. And that's great. You are great accountants and what other things that like introverts, I, I am so proud of y'all, right? <laughs> but we are told that everything we do, whether eating, and I love eating, whether drinking, whatever it is, do it for the glory of God. So when Paul talks about this unified community, right, when he's writing these letters and he's stressing this unity, it's for a reason. Paul isn't just breathing hot air just to say what he wants to say. At the time of writing the letter, the church was already divided. Can we imagine that? Scholars estimate that the letter to the Romans was written around the year 57 A.D., this is less than 25 years after the death of Jesus, a time in which people who were in the church walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, asked him questions, were blessed, had miracles performed right in front of them. And yet they couldn't agree on doctrine. They couldn't agree on liturgy. They couldn't agree on what worship looked like and who led worship. And it's a good thing we don't deal with those issues, right? 
And if this sounds familiar, it's because it is. And don't get me wrong, Paul makes his case for proper doctrine elsewhere, but he also stresses to the church in Rome that they are one. They are one body, one that has many parts. I joked at the 930 that Daniel gave me the most complicated commentary on Romans he could find. And so in using that to prepare for this, it was not helpful a lot of the time. But in that, Peter Oakes writes that this part of Romans 12 functions to both undermine the competition for honor that existed as well as undermine the status system. So the way that a lot of these churches worked then, right, is they would gather around a table, they would break bread, and they would talk about God, share testimonies, things like that, right? But there was a a hierarchy that existed at these tables. The closer you were to the center, the more important you were. And if you know anything about human nature, we're going to compete to be at the center of that, right? So this part of Romans 12 was very specific to undermine those systems which existed in the church to say that these people who are in the church— are more important than you. You eat later, you drink later, you receive communion later. Paul writes to undermine that. In fact, Peter Oakes goes so far as to say that this is a radical assault on the assumptions that flowed from that system. It makes sense. If you're not a Christian and you walk by and you see that there's this hierarchy that exists within the church that reflects how you treat those outside of the church as well. So when we think of the church as a body and one that cannot exist as an individual, but is rather commanded to act in community, who is our appendix? Who are we comfortable with excluding from the walls of our sanctuary? And that's a real question, because I guarantee you, there is one person that if they walked through the doors of this church, you would be frustrated and you would be disappointed, and you are much more comfortable here today because they are not here. So who are we comfortable with excluding from our walls? At one point, I was at a church in which my wife and I, we were treated as the appendix. We were treated as expendable, as not needed, as not essential to the church. And this led us to First United Methodist Belton. And from day one, that church was home. Let me tell you this. This church was, uh, it, it was, it was very contemporary. And after I was treated as the appendix there, I was like, what's the opposite of contemporary? So I went to Mass. And uh, Mass is beautiful, and I love Mass, right? But um, I was looking for something a little different. But throughout all of that, different liturgies, different worship, different styles of sermons. It wasn't that that kept me coming back to First United Methodist Belton. I didn't know who John Wesley was. It was the fact that I was treated as a valued member of a community. It wasn't even the size of the church. When we went there, there were 20 people. It was in a church that was way too big for the size of its congregation. But we were welcomed and valued as members of the body of Christ. I can tell you this. While the church does not just exist within these walls or within the walls of a sanctuary, the exclusion of those from these walls can make sure that someone leaves forever. Four years ago, I was done with church. I started my Northwestern Seminary application yesterday. A lot can change when we are brought into the church. But at the same time, if I had not felt valued there, I might still be done with church. I might have given up and said, this is not for me. So let's return to that question. Who is our appendix? Now, if you want the biblical answer, which I hope you do, and if you want the answer that Jesus gave, which again, I hope you do, it is no one. In fact, it is not just enough to assert that all are welcome. It's not just enough to say that I really, I know a lot of us, we wish it was, but we are called to live that out. We are active participants in this radical upheaval of social forces that label others as not good enough, not worthy, not desirable, too poor, too weird. They believe differently. They look differently. They act differently. But Christ tells us that does not matter. This is the root of the church. This is the root of my testimony. It's the root of the mission of Jesus. It is the root of the faith. All are called. And all are welcome to receive the greatest gift. 
And again, this unity does not assume that we are all the same. And this unity does not assume that we all function the same way, but the rejection of anyone as worthy of being members of the church is the arrogance to assume that we can be the hands and the feet. It is the arrogance to assume that in our own redemption from brokenness and sin, that we then get to turn and determine who is worthy of being the body of Christ. It is to assume that we are going to be able to replace the talents, the beauty, the fullness, which any and every single person adds to the body of Christ. We are cutting off the arms, calling it the appendix, when the appendix does not exist in the body of Christ. And this benefit, it's not just for the church. So let's take a step back. I think a lot of times when we read things in the Bible, we think, well, like God tells us that, so we'll just do that. And we don't realize that it's for our own benefit as well. And a simple example is, thou shall not lie. It has practical benefits to be in a community where you can trust others, where you can love others and know that they're going to be honest in what they do and what they say. So this benefit of unity, of being one body, also is for us. And it's no secret that we as a society are lonely. And as third spaces, which are places that are not home and they're not work, right? Places that uh, my grandparents, my great-grandparents have, but they're dying out. That's the truth. They are dying out. And as we become more entrenched in our phones, we are now lonelier than ever, one out of every five members of Gen Z, my generation, report that they always feel lonely. And you may say that's one out of every five, so four out of every five, but think about that. There were different, you didn't have to pick always lonely. You could pick mostly, sometimes, rarely, never. One out of every five said always. That is something that they carry with them when they wake up, when they go about their day-to-day -day lives, and when they go home, when they go to bed, it's always with them, and they carry that with them. And this study was done by the Eden Project Communities, which is a nonprofit committed to, quote, building stronger communities. And when looking at their mission statement, they say they are aiming to create areas in which people know one another and neighborhoods thrive. How beautiful is that? So how do they do that? According to them, the challenges of our society and planet that we will face demand the best from all of us and the ability to work together. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Is that not the heart of the gospel? Is that not the root of what we believe? That's what Jesus asks from us. That's all throughout the Bible. We see ordinary people doing extraordinary things. It later goes on to mention that there are two types of social interaction. There's bonding and there's bridging. And unfortunately, we do way too much bonding. In our free time, we seek out people who are like us, who believe like us, who are interested in the same things, and we share that. And one of the beautiful things about the challenge that Marquise offered was that we were bridging in those moments, and we were meeting with people who don't think like us, don't look like us, don't act like us, over a shared sense of community. How beautiful would our world look like if we were able to bridge better? What would political tension look like if we were able to build these bridges rather than bond with those we already think like? But it's not just the church that sees what has been coined the loneliness epidemic. However, the church is in a unique position in the fact that the solution is woven into the foundation of our institution. Church does not happen within the walls of the sanctuary. Church happens when we love others. Church happens when the tables we build are full, and when they are full, they are extended, and when we show others who may have never felt love, there is a place for you right here, right now. That is why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians that it doesn't matter what we can do. If we don't do it with love, it means nothing. They are hollow acts. They might as well not happen. Our church, our community, and our world is greatest when we can humble ourselves enough to serve where we are called to serve. Because there are a lot of places we could serve, 
And there are a lot of places we're not called to serve. And even if we have to go reluctantly, humbling yourself enough to go is still an act of Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes, the more genuine and the deeper our community becomes, the more will everything else between us recede, the more clearly and purely will Jesus Christ and his work become the one and only thing that is vital between us. And it's hard. Of course it's hard. When has following Jesus ever been easy? When I feel convicted, I'm just going to be honest with you, all right, I go to UH, and in my mind, there are a lot of really weird people that go to UH. Now, that's an ego thing. I need to work on it, I know, but sometimes I feel convicted to go and to talk to people and to learn about them. And I resist that, and I'm like, oh, God, I don't want to. And I think back to Paul. No money in a prison, not knowing what was going to happen tomorrow, still extending words of encouragement to one another. I think about the disciples who did not meet great ends. And I think back to my issue, being at a college and not wanting to go talk to someone. And in the grand scheme, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. And the people are never as weird as we build them up to be in our head, right? But we don't do these things because they're easy. We do them because we are the church, and that is what the church is called to do. And we do have to pull our weight in that. I have one more embarrassing story for you. Um, sophomore year of college, I decided I was going to play rugby. And I went to exactly one practice. Um, UH has a large international student population, and what that means is that we also have a lot of people uh, who are you know, from Australia and the surrounding islands. And uh, they, take, they take rugby very seriously. Um, and here's how little I know about rugby, is I still don't know what a scrum does, but I was put in the middle of a scrum. And so I should have sent a picture, I didn't, that's my fault. But a, a scrum is where you link arms, and in my case with people who are a foot taller than you, and you push, and you're pushing up against these people who are like humongous. Like, I, I cannot accurately describe to you how big these people are. But we, on our side of the scrum, were much bigger than the other side. But we lost. Because the middle, which is where I was at, collapsed every time. <laughs> That's how the body of Christ operates. We have to pull our weight. Because it doesn't matter if a quarter of the room, or if 90% of the room tells someone, you are welcome. The 10% can make sure that no one ever comes back and all are welcome and all need to be here because we do community, we do life together. It's better. Life is beautiful and life is hard, but it's something that needs to be done together. Will you bow your heads with me? God, I want to thank you for the opportunity to worship freely and to know that there is no appendix. And I want to thank you for acknowledging the, the hands, the feet, the eyes, the mouth. And I pray that we can alter our focus to see the world and to see others more like you. And as we pray in the way that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.